I'll read this into the record. And this is document number 20698, 46th Ward ordinance was referred on May 26th of 2021. Yeah, uh, we, we, excuse me. Common address, 4600 North Marine Drive, change request. Residential Institutional Plan Development number 37, to Residential Institutional Plan Development number 37 as amended. Uh, Paul Shadle is the attorney on this. Yeah, and as I said earlier, this was, uh, we had some uh, three uh, three or so comments uh, in uh, opposing this one in the public comment period. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, uh, Paul Shadle uh, with the law firm of DLA Piper along with my colleague, Katie Janky Dale representing Lincoln Property Company National LLC, the applicant in this matter. Uh, also with us today are Joe Segoviano from the applicant and Bob Weber, our architect. Uh, this matter was heard by the plan commission on July 15th, and I would ask that the record of that proceeding be incorporated into this proceeding. So Vice Chair Raboyas moves to incorporate the records from the plan commission by the same roll call that was used to determine quorum. Any objections? So moved. Hearing none, uh, the records are incorporated and we can continue on. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, as you see on your screen now, the site is located at the northwest corner of Wilson and Marine Drive. The image before you shows the proposed building, which would sit on what is now a surface parking lot. The request is to amend the PD to permit the improvement with this building, which would contain 314 dwelling units. Uh, the of those dwelling units eight on site would be affordable uh, to residents eligible at incomes at or below 60 percent of ami also as part of the affordable requirements ordinance uh, compliance the applicant would donate uh, just a little bit more than three million dollars to a fund that would support the development by sarah's circle of a project also in the 46th ward that would serve residents eligible at or below 30 percent of area median income uh, the in lieu fee for that is intended to support approximately 23 additional units. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the building that you see is uh, the result of a long process led by Alderman Kappelman and the Department of Planning and Development. Uh, Lincoln began that process in January of 2020, had uh, extensive meetings with, again, the Department of Planning and Development, and also through Alderman Kappelman with uh, both the Zoning and Development Committee of the 46th Ward, Uptown United, and other groups in the 46th Ward. The building was fairly substantially revised based on those meetings. The elevation that you see before you is the east elevation, that, that elevation in particular. And then if you could go to the next slide, the south elevation, which fronts on Wilson, also was changed in order to enhance materials, add more glazing, and, and make other changes to, to have the building integrate more directly with the street. Um, this project is expected to generate fairly substantial public benefits. It's about an $80 million capital investment, approximately a thousand construction jobs, substantial additional property tax revenue. Uh, um, in keeping with the mayor's executive order, the developer will seek to include 26% MBE and 6% WBA on the project and 50% city resident hiring. Um, we'd like to thank Alderman Kappelman, the Departments of Planning and Development, CDOT, and the Department of Housing for this innovative ARO compliance structure. And as I noted, we have others, oh, and also Michael Berkshire and others of the Department of Planning and Development staff for working with us in this process. Um, as I noted at the beginning, we have others from our team available to answer questions and would respectfully request this committee's positive recommendation to the full council. Right. Okay. Uh, I think Alderman Kappelman, would you like to hear questions first or do you want to speak now? You can always close. I can speak now. Okay. Uh, thank you, Chairman Tunney. I, you know, I, I've heard many times over at this meeting and at other meetings about uh, people's concerns about displacement. And, and to be honest, you know, the concerns about displacement, are, they're occurring across this country and, and, you know, it's happening here in Uptown, which is one of the most diverse communities in the city. And, and for that reason, residents are rightly focused on protecting it. Uh, I started here as a social worker in Uptown 33 years ago, where I, I first helped settle refugees into the area. And I later worked as a case manager where I had a caseload of people 
uh, living with HIV, many of whom were also diagnosed with a mental illness and they were living in the streets. Um, Uptown has a long history of having some of the highest rates of uh, subsidized housing in the city. Uh, in addition, around 50% of our housing is naturally occurring affordable housing. And that is defined as market rate housing for people who earn around 60% of the AMI or less. Uh, we also have seven homeless shelters within five blocks of this site. Um, these uh, shelter residents are, uh, are individuals who are in desperate straits for affordable housing set for people earning 15% of the AMI. Uh, I say 15% because many of them are in SSI, Supplemental Security Income, and their, um, their income is $792 a month. These are individuals who would never qualify for on-site affordable housing because it's set at 60%. In recent years, uh, Uptown has become a victim of its own success. Uh, three and a half years ago, a, a $203 million makeover of the Wilson CTA station was completed. In the last five years, uh, violent crime in the area has dropped to an all-time low. It's the lowest we've ever seen since we've started recording violent crime in the city. And those two factors have made the uptown community a much more attractive uh, place for people to live. Uh, Commissioner Navarro uh, told me earlier this week, um, actually last week, um, that she spoke with someone who was quite concerned about gentrification in Uptown. And she told this person not building more affordable housing, not, no, excuse me, not building more housing will not stop people from moving into the area. Uh, my concern is that if we don't build more, developers will go after our naturally occurring affordable housing and upgrade that. And that is the issue. It's by building more housing that we're able to help protect our naturally occurring affordable housing. Uh, with regards to the ARO for this project, I worked with the Department of Housing to do something a bit unusual. One quarter of the 10% affordable housing is on site for people earning 60%, the AMI, and the remaining requirement will go to Sarah Circle to build 100% affordable housing um, apartment building that will be constructed about two blocks away. So this $3 million plus in lieu fee will complete the financing needed to fully fund their project. Uh, looking at all the different options, the Department of Housing provided a letter of support for fulfilling the ARO in this manner. In their letter of support, it was stated, quote, contributing the ARO obligations directly to an approved affordable development like Sarah Circle enables the affordable development to be built quicker, provide surety of their financing, and may reduce routine compliance related costs for the affordable owner. Now, many of us in city council, we don't like the offsite affordable housing option because we can't guarantee the in lieu fee will build housing in our wards. However, this in lieu uh, option provides housing within my ward, but rather than have it focus on people earning 60% of the AMI, it will go to women who earn 15% or less of the AMI. These are individuals who would never qualify for on-site housing because they earn too little. They are the ones who are most at risk for living on the streets. Uh, there have been some uh, fears expressed that allowing Weiss Memorial Hospital to sell an asphalt parking lot that's no longer needed will spur the sale of the entire hospital. I get it. I really get it about the lack of trust for Pipeline, which owns Weiss hospital. However, uh, Pipeline has invested so far um, around $40 million into upgrading this hospital, and they have pledged to use the entire proceeds of the sale of the parking lot into the hospital's programming, which includes a gender confirmation program for the trans community. And as a former social worker in the hospital who worked in the hospitals, 20 years in the hospitals, that's very, very difficult to come by. 
They also provide health care to many of our area families and seniors who rely on Medicaid. So you don't invest this amount of money into a hospital if you have plans to turn around and sell it. Um, nevertheless, if Pipeline made the decision to sell this hospital, it sits on a planned development site that requires medical use. So unlike Westlake that Pipeline sold, having WISE on a planned development site provides the needed safeguards to keep it as a facility that provides medical care for our local community. So, you know, with that, I ask my colleagues to support this project and vote, and vote in favor of this proposal and also like to hear any questions. Oh, all right. We've got a couple hands up. Um, we'll start uh, the, with uh, Alderwoman Haddon. Great. Thank you, Chair. Um, and thanks, Alderman Kappelman, for, for kind of the, the intro there. A um, couple questions for, I guess, Lincoln Property Company representatives um, and the attorney. Um, could you uh, share again, and I'm, I'm sorry if I missed this, um, could you share again some information about the, I guess, the, your target audience for your tenants? Um, what's the unit mix going to look like? Um, who's this building for? Yes, I would ask uh, Joe Segoviano from Lincoln to address that, and please identify yourself for the record, Joe. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Joe Segobiano with Lincoln Property Company. Um, to answer your question, uh, committee member, right now we are looking at about 86 studios, 164 one unit, um, and then 56 two bedroom units. In addition to that, we would have the affordables as two studios, four one bedrooms, and two two bedroom units. So the mix is about 27% studios, 52% two bedrooms, and 17%, almost 18%, um, two bedrooms, 52% one bedroom. And could you tell me the average square foot, I guess, of your one bedroom? Sure, of course. Um, the average square foot on a one bedroom is about 700 square feet. And then the average square foot on a two bedroom is about 1,100 square feet. And your studios? Uh, studios are 472 square feet. These are not micro units. These are all market rate sizes. They are not micro units. Um, so that was a conscious decision that we made going into the early design phase of the project. Gotcha. Still a lot of a lot of studios in one bedroom. So not really necessarily geared towards families or kind of multi generational households. I guess there. Um, uh, and then. I guess maybe this this question there's in the community comments and some of the um, written comments we received um, for Lincoln properties. There were some talk of lawsuits, uh, some class action suits, some discrimination suits. I'm wondering if you guys could address those concerns um, about you as a company. Sure. Um, actually, I have a prepared statement on that. I'd like to read. Uh, Lincoln Property Company is a national company that prides itself on diversity among the employees as well as within our communities. We have approximately 5,000 employees and approximately 700 communities around the country. Um, we self-manage our, our communities and we own our communities long term and therefore we're committed to being a part of the neighborhood and contribute to the current diversity as well as the long term viability and success of the neighborhood. Um, we typically implement programs to interact with our neighborhood, uh, like hosting local businesses or supporting supporting local endeavors, um, such as Sarah Circle or public art or things of that sort. Um, I am not aware of any current uh, lawsuits. I know that I am in, in charge of the Midwest development here, and we have approximately 39 communities in Chicagoland, 23 in the city of Chicago, and we do not have any uh, lawsuits with regard to discrimination in any of those communities. Okay, thank you. Thank you for answering that question. Um, I appreciate that. Um, uh, I guess another question, I mean, I, Alderman Kappelman, I know you kind of addressed and tried to reassure us around pipeline. I, I do want to say as the Alderman of the 49th and a residence of Rogers Park, um, this is, this is 
kind of the closest hospital that we have that's in Chicago. Um, so my residents uh, use use uh, use the hospital. Um, it's I, I hear your comments about hey why would they invest money if they plan to close it? Uh, their their track record with Westlake gives me a lot of pause, um, especially in in the way that they closed it. Uh, I believe it was through bankruptcy, so I could see someone investing money um, in a venture that they really know isn't going to pay off. And so looking at this loss of property um, as part of the hospital campus, even if you, you're saying it's underutilized, if, if the pipeline's like selling off this and using it to, to invest, but I look at that, that aerial photo and we should be investing in our medical systems. We should be investing and growing them. And it's very concerning to me um, about, and, and I don't think anyone from pipelines here, because I know they're, they're not uh, on the table here for this development, but looking at the space we're losing, um, how will this hospital grow to accommodate people? Um, how are we increasing our medical infrastructure? Um, and I just see a loss of land here. And what I already know is a very compact um, and dense space. And it literally is leaving like no room for growth, especially when we talk about the planned development for medical use. Um, so I have some big concerns there as to the proposed future um, and how shaky it is in, in working with, with this particular operator. Um, I can last... answer that question if you'd sure. like. Sure. Uh, if you look at the drawing, there's uh, office, uh, medical offices just north of the hospital proper itself. Uh, in the 10 years I've been uh, uh, alder person in the 46th ward, those medical offices have been between 50 and 80% vacant. Um, and they are still, I think it's over 50% vacancy rate in the medical offices. And so uh, Weiss, has hopes and they're working on plans to filling up those office spaces, but it's it's still a long ways to go be, before that can happen. So that's where the expansion can happen and it's needed. And I would just note Alderman Hatton uh, that the, the plan development also allows substantial additional floor area for hospital use, should that be avail you know possible in the future. They'd have to come in and get approvals from you for the actual physical improvements, but there is floor area available for hospital use. Um, so then uh, last question for me. Um, I am wondering, and I don't know if we've got anybody here from the city to speak or Alderman Kaplan, maybe this is for you, um, but you know, residents were really raising concerns about the location of the backup generators for the entire north side. Um, some of our generators that are located kind of um, uh, at the space and some concerns about um, how these will be impacted with the construction. Just wondering if somebody could uh, expound on that. I know that right directly west of it is uh, Lakeview Towers. Um, it's it's our largest uh, uh, not-for-profit affordable housing in the 46th Ward. And, uh, having that location there, we've never experienced any issues before. Um, of, in, in all the discussions that we've had with the city and Department of Planning Development and Department of Housing, um, that concern never came up. Um, all right. Um, I think those are my questions for now. Um, I still have a lot of concerns about this project. All right. Thank you, Alderwoman. Um, Alderman Cicho Lopez. Um, thank you. Um, thank you, Chairman. Um, and um, we'd like to add to some of the concerns that Alderwoman had and had in, um, in this particular project. I, I hope everybody in the, in the committee was able to, to get the letters. You know, of course, it's important to hear directly from um, the constituents. Um, some of the concerns that I have um, have to do with, um, you know, the community's uh, perspective on this. Uh, and I want to quote one of the senators, there's at least two senators who have sent letters of opposition, uh, Senator Sarah Finger quotes, um, uh, states the following, and I do think that this is important. Um, and I'd like to maybe see if Alderman Kaplan can respond to this. 
um, since November 2019, I have heard from various community stakeholders and residents who reside close to the proposed development, most of whom have demonstrated their opposition to the current proposal. Although I believe that the alderman has good intentions, I struggle with the prospect of only 300 studio units with only 2% on site affordability. Then, of course, he mentions the rental ranges from 1300 to 1600, making them unaffordable to many community members who have called this area home for decades. My question to Alderman Kappelman is, and again, we have seen in front of our community and our committee many projects that come in front of us. Uh, I really commend Alder Woman King for taking her time. I know she's got a lot of pressure to uh, press forward with her proposal in Brownsville uh, in a big proposal. Um, my concern and my question is, why is the rush? It seems like, again, from a senator's perspective, there seems to be a lot of sentiment. And I think there seems like there's uh, a, a majority of the community who have serious concerns. Uh, what is the rush? And can we, I mean, I will say that it'll be important for, for these issues and, and local officials to work together to address the current concerns so that we can provide the benefits that the community needs. So that's my question. And I'm sorry, I was a little long. I wanna make sure that I'm factual and I state some of the um, some of the reasons why some local officials are opposing this. Thank you. I'd like to address that. Um, uh, State Senator Feigenhold um, was incorrect about the makeup of the amount of housing. It's, it's not 300 units of studios, um, and the developer already talked about that mix of two bedrooms, actually the majority one bedroom, and some studios that currently exist there. And there, in her letter, she also talked about a state law that would encourage um, uh, the, uh, the ARO to happen on site. Which, which is a laudable thing to happen. Um, my concern has always been though, that um, uh, the residents who are uh, most at risk for living on the streets earn 15% of the area median income. So even with the state law that's been recently passed, it would not help them. I, I need help for women who are living on the streets. And this particular um, ARO, the way it's laid out at the, uh, at the uh, support of the Department of Housing allows us to build 28 units of affordable housing for women uh, who would otherwise be living on the street. Yeah, uh, and as far as the support of the community, um, I have a 35 member uh, zoning and development committee. Uh, uh, it is made up of organizations spread throughout the ward and areas of greater density have more representation because 25% of the area residents have low income, 25% of the members of the zoning committee uh, represent uh, that group. Uh, there was a vote and it was very, very close. It was 16 in favor, 15 opposed, but just like every alderman does across the city, I'm no different. Uh, the vote of this committee is advisory only. Um, if I strictly go with what the committee wants, then I would support the vote of the 46 Ward Zoning Development Committee, which uh, voted in favor and supported this project. Yeah, and, and Alderman uh, Kaplman, again, I think my my concern, again, it goes that it seems like you said, even in your own committee, you have a very split decision. You have at least two senators who are expressing serious concerns about the implications. Alderman Manhattan mentioned around um, the questioning around uh, pipeline health that is still, um, you know, the track record doesn't really reassure uh, some of the commitments that even have maybe done in other parts of the county and the city. So my question again is, will this be something that you can um, reconvene? I think that it seems like having more time uh, perhaps can um, help the community and, and your own committee to address some of the concerns as we have seen. And again, I will wanna point out to all the women King's um, proposal. 
having a little bit extra time certainly has shaped. I mean, I think we're all uh, commending her efforts and I think we have more community benefits. Uh, I, I just still don't know what, what is the rush. Will this something that you can perhaps take a little bit more time? I do think luxury condos can wait, but having making mistakes when it comes to public health, when it comes to um, residents who are in dire need, I do think that will be a detriment uh, to the whole community and the whole city. So will this be something that you can consider and give give the community a little bit more time so that you can discuss this properly? I think that you have some serious concerns, including from local officials. So with all due respect, this is not a condominium. These are apartments. And um, I, I know that uh, State Senator Feigenholz meant well. When, but she had the facts wrong about the 300 units of, of uh, studio apartments. And she uh, also is focusing on uh, families and, and individuals earning 60%. Uh, she did not address the need that I see in this community. And that is the need for housing for people earning 15% or, the, or less of the area median income. In my discussions with State Senator Mike uh, Simmons, uh, he addressed the concerns that this would cause gentrification. And um, uh, I pointed him to a number of different uh, studies that show that not building more housing will not stop gentrification. Um, the way to address gentrification is to build more housing because that stabilizes rents. And that's what we need is a stabilization of rents. And if we do not build more um, of this type of housing, then developers will go after our naturally occurring affordable housing as they already have. That's why I lost the Chateau. That's how I lost the Norman. That's how I lost the Darlington. That's how I lost the Lawrence House. That's how I lost the Hazleton. I want to put a stop to that. I want uh, housing uh, more housing so that developers don't go after our naturally occurring affordable housing. That's what's keeping our residents, many who've been living here for generations, that's what's keeping them here. And, <clears throat> All right, let me, let me interrupt for a second. There's a couple things I want to say. Number one is that the rules committee will, will meet uh, directly after the zoning meeting. And then the next thing before I ask uh, CCO to continue is there are many different committees in city council. Some are finance, some are development, some are housing. This is the zoning committee. And you know, we, there's all sorts of battles about, about affordability and some other issues. I, I, I would like to stay as close to the zoning on this parcel and, and try to keep it uh, focused on the ability for them to change the zoning as Alderman Kappelman says, um, this the cross factor with the hospital, maybe this development will keep them running for the north side for many, many years. Uh, but this is all part of a planned development that we're releasing this one this one parcel. Um, but I think it's ordered to, to sustain, I believe, and I trust, and I know this came up in plan commission quite a bit, um, that they will be uh, valued valued health partners for many years. Whether or not you can trust that, that's a whole different issue. But I, I would like to make sure that um, that we try to make sure that, that we respect the development and the zoning process and then issues about affordability and some other things. Um, you know, yes, they're part of zoning, but I think that they're, they're well discussed in some other aspects of our city council. So with that, um, Chairman uh, Byron, or, hold on a second. I'm going to do Byron, you want to finish your thoughts or questions? Thank you, Chairman. And I, I'll, uh, um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll keep it brief. Uh, I, and I, I appreciate that. I think let's focus on the zoning aspect of it. Uh, and that's what I, um, I'm urging um, Alderman Kaplman, uh, just knowing and the facts are there. I think the fact of the matter remains is a very um, contested issue in the community. Uh, I do think that we ought, and especially with this, this very trying times, to make zoning decisions that do not negatively impact uh, the well-being of the entire community. That's what I um, I wanted to ask if he would consider having more time so that he can address some of the concerns. The last thing I'd like to say, just 
in terms of questions. Uh, and I do challenge some of the decisions in the planning commission, as well as some of the arguments that were made in terms of zoning. Uh, the supply side of economics is a highly subjective matter. Uh, supply side economics, meaning uh, if we build more housing, supply will meet the demand. We have seen how supply side of economics have unfortunately uh, been proven wrong in multiple locations. We have a lot of vacant luxury housing. And what we do need is also uh, making sure that we have um, public services like public health, especially now. So my last question, uh, and again, in order to protect a naturally occurring um, affordable housing is to protect uh, or or homeowners or small homeowners to protect the social fabric or communities by taking the time to listen to those who are affected. We know that we have a broken property tax assessment system. We do know that there's many variables. I contest that's the notion of supply side economics that we just need to build more and we wanna address some of the issues. That is incorrect. It is not based on any facts. There may be a study, but I tell you that what we do need is to build affordable housing on site that's proven to work and also more than anything else, listen to our constituents. I would like to just urge- Chairman, point of information. I don't- Alderman Wagestack. I know we're repeating the same thing here, but the there is no question that Alderman Kappelman did not listen to his constituents. I, 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 I just, I can we stick to the facts of zoning? All right. All right, so I was, I was responding to an, an argument, making sure that we're taking the time to have a conversation. Right. I understand that Robert, Robert Stem Alderman can do whatever they want, but here in the council, oh, we can have a debate. Chairman. All yeah. right, so yeah. with that, with that, uh, Alderman, um, Alderman Kappelman, I believe, as he stated, has had a robust process. Uh, like we all ask each other to respect the communities that we represent, and I know he does a good job doing that. Um, there's disagreements, uh, but I think uh, points have been set on both sides and I'm gonna ask to move to Alderman Rodriguez. Thank you, Chair. And uh, forgive me, I'm uh, just getting myself ready here. Uh, just quick questions. I like my colleagues uh, would like to get on to the next couple of committees, so I'll be quick. Quick, forgive me. Um, wondering if the zoning administrator or someone from the city could respond to the following question around the pending change in ARO, and if that would have uh, an impact on this project if it were to uh, be delayed several months. Good question. All right, Patrick Murphy, or somebody from planning, please. Hello. No. Patrick, Patrick Murphy. Steve. Or Steve. Sorry, sir. Yeah. Oh, there he is. All right, that Go sounds on. like Patrick. Okay. So did you hear the question it, from Alderman it, Rodriguez? It was, yes, it was. Sorry. Okay. So would you respond, please? Sorry, I sorry, I was trying to get a different call and I did not hear the alderman's question. I'm sorry. Right, Steve, just, if you did, if you want to answer. No, no, let Mike let Mike re, Michael re, sure. repeat the question, please. Sure, thanks, Tom. Uh Patrick, just wondering if there would be any change uh any impacts on the change in the and the pending change in the ARO if this uh project were to be delayed several months. Oh, oh, so um you mean if it gets delayed beyond the October first of the ARO. Exactly. exactly. Well, that would, I don't know all the specific ARO requirements under this project, but yes, the way it's written now, if it's, if, if there is an ARO impact and it's moved to after October 1st, then the new ARO would apply. Okay. Th thanks, Patrick. Um, all right. But you wouldn't know the, the actual impacts on, on this project then. I don't know off the top of my head, but I will, I will figure it out and get back on here. Yeah. I, I, that, that would be good to know. And then uh, just uh, just another question. Uh, I'm not sure who this would be for, but it, uh, uh, maybe for the developer, was there a traffic study done or an, and or an environmental uh, impact study done in this project? Alderman Rodriguez, I can address that. Paul Shadle again with DLA Piper. Yes, there was a traffic study done uh, by KLOA. It was vetted by the Department of Transportation and the Department of Transportation approved this plan. Okay, anything on the on, on environmental impacts? Uh, it, as far as uh, there was a 
you know, they would do a typical phase one to confirm that they can buy the property. In terms of uh, sustainability, environmental sustainability, the project will comply fully with the city's sustainability policy. Okay, that's all I have. Thank you. All right. Um, Chairman Tunney? Uh, uh, Alderman Kaplan. I just want to say that um, the affordable ordinance, the affordable requirements ordinance that was passed to revise it, um, my suggestion is if we are going to apply this ordinance, it needs to be applied equitably across the city. We cannot pick and choose which developments need to um, um, be reviewed after the new ARO comes in existence and, and not do that to all the other projects. All right. Thank you. All right. I did see Alderwoman Haddon's hand up again. I, do you want to ask a question or two more, Marie? Thank you, Chairman. I appreciate it. Um, thanks for your patience, colleagues. Um, I actually, I, I know we're talking about the zoning. I had one more question that was a follow-up um, for, for Joe, and this was, uh, Alderman Kappelman, this was, you, you mentioned that Uptown's become a, a, what was this, victim of its own success. Um, as a neighboring neighborhood that also historically thrives with affordable housing, but is seeing different changes. Um, I have a lot of questions about how our zoning decisions Im impact that and affordability. And so I'm wondering, Joe, uh, what are the proposed rents for these for these places, given that we're not putting a lot of affordable on site? Um, how much are you charging? Sure. Um, be happy to address that. Our rents are at about $1,600 for a studio for the market, about $898 for an affordable unit, for one bedroom there at about $2,200 for the market rate, $951 for an affordable, and for a two bedroom there about $2,900 for a market rate and $1,100 for an affordable. I would also like to add that based on the current statistics, um, about 50% of the current residents would qualify to live in this building. Um, qualifications would be 32 grand um, on an affordable unit and 62 grand a year for a market rate unit. Thank you for that information, Joe. I appreciate that. Um, I'll say, you know, Alderman Kappelman, I know you had the community advisory board and I know you told us those vote results. Um, I do know just because of some of the articles. Um, and I know we spoke last month that, you know, there was a vote that was changed. Um, gentrification, um, the loss of affordable housing, of SROs, um, the big changes we've seen in Uptown, like developments like this might be making space for, for some more people to come in. And I, you know, I look at the density, uh, you and I, and actually Alderman Rodriguez have some of the most densely populated wards um, in the city as we look at our geography. So I really question um, on a zoning basis, right? If this is the best use, um, the displacement of people who've left uptown because of the loss of affordable housing. You mentioned all those buildings that you've lost and I very much know the struggle of not having a lot of tools to keep those buildings, right? Like we can't dictate who buys and sells their property. And also this just does not seem to be the type of place that current low-income uptown residents are going to be able to live. Um, I don't think there are enough community benefits going into this. And so, uh, you know, I would, you know, I can't support this project um, based on where it's at. And, you know, respectfully, I'd, I'd move a motion, uh, Chairman, to, to defer this. Um, I put that motion forward. So on a motion to defer, uh, we're going to have to take a roll call on that, correct? Okay. All right. So Alderman Haddon makes the motion uh, to defer this, and I'm going to start with the roll call. So obviously, we have Alderman Kappelman uh, wants to move this forward today, and uh, voting yes would defer it. So date certain and voting no would be to continue to have a, a vote on this today. All right. So so 
Uh, Alderman Hopkins. Alderman Dow. No. Alderman Sawyer. Alderman Beal. Alderman uh, Ray Lopez. No. Alderman David Moore. No. Alderman Mike Rodriguez. Yes. Alderman Cicho Lopez. Aye. Alderman Burnett. No. Alderman Cardona. No. Alderman Wagaspak. No. Alderman Austin. No. Alderman Viegas. Alderman Riley. No. Alderman Kappelman. No. Alderman Osterman. No. Alderman Haddon. Aye. And Chairman Tunney is a no. Beal's a no. I'm sorry. Who did I hear that? Beal's a no. Beal. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. Vice Chair Ravoyas, I forgot. No. Okay. So um, that being said, uh, we will continue on and I'll I'll entertain a motion uh, to move to pass by the same roll call that was used to determine. So move, Mr. Chairman. All Mike right. to be recorded as a no chair. Okay. Did I see other hands up? No. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, yeah, I have my hand up. Okay. We'll start with uh, Alderman Dowell. Yeah, I thank you, Chairman. Um, I just wanted to uh, say to Alderman Kappelman that I know he's very thoughtful about how he approaches housing development in his ward. And Alderman Kappelman, I don't know if this is appropriate, uh, but I just want you to tell our committee how you see the housing landscape up in Uptown. You and I have discussed this, so um, I, I think your view on how you're approaching this is helpful. Okay, and I appreciate the question, and I'm going to ask Alderman Kappelman to, to uh, respond, but before... Briefly. Before he does briefly, Alderman Beal, was there a question on process or something else? It was a procedure, Mr. Chairman. Um, you know, I think it's only right procedurally that you announce what the vote is before moving on. Oh, my. thank you very much for uh, processing that with me. The, the vote 13 net in the negative and three in the affirmative. All right. The, mo the motion has failed and I ask for oh, uh, a vote from the um, committee in regards to the uh, positive vote of from the vote to establish quorum. But before we get that, Alderman Kaplan, would you want to say the, the final comment on this? Sure. It's uh, Alderman Dow. Uh, thanks for the question, and it's a tough one that we all grapple with. Um, and I answer it the way I, I answer any tough decision that I'm faced with. Um, there's three criteria. Number one, I look at what's ultimately fair uh, on all sides. That's that's really important to me. And all the conversations I've had with with uh, Mayor Lightfoot and our uh, previous mayor, um, I've said, if you want to appeal to me, appeal first to my sense of fairness. Uh, secondly, I want to make sure that what we're doing is based on the use of evidence-based best practices. So I looked I've done an incredible amount of research about what cities across the country are doing to protect and build more affordable housing. And um, I, I've also had extensive conversations with Commissioner Cox and Commissioner Navarra about that. And then the third and final thing that's most important to me is I want to make sure whatever I look at, I understand the negative repercussions of that decision. And if I don't understand those negative repercussions, then I believe I'm not adequately educated on that subject. And for this particular uh, development, and we've had, oh, 
in five large committee meetings, two to three hours long. The meetings are even on the ward website, the taped meetings. Um, um, we looked at all the, the different ramifications and this is what we decided. And this is what I believe is going to work best um, for protecting the diversity uh, in the uptown uh, community. So, so thank you so much. Okay, thank you, Alderman Kappelman. So I got a motion to move to pass by the same roll call that was used to determine quorum by Alderman Kerry Austin. Any objections to um, the motion? Alderman Haddon would like to be recorded as a no, please, Chair. Alderman Haddon is, is a no. Are there any other comments? Okay, so this uh, item is passed as revised with the uh, noting that Alderman Maria Haddon is a no vote on this item. Uh, Mr. So Chairman, I, sorry, uh, Alderman Sitcha Lopez also is a no. Okay, so we'll record both uh, Alderman Haddon and Alderman Sitcha Lopez. Cicho Lopez as a, as knows. All right. Anything else? All right. Then I need a motion. Chairman, I move to adjourn. Alderman thank Lopez. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Thank you. And thank you. Um, Alderman Lopez makes the motion to adjourn. So the meeting, any opposed to the motion? No. <laughs> Hearing on this meeting is adjourned. And as we said, thank you everybody for the long meeting. And uh, we're now going into rules. Uh, we'll be starting momentarily. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Chairman.